In today's reading, we are given an example of gratitude. I am reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with skin diseases approached him. Keeping their distance from him, they raised their voices and said, Jesus, Master, show us mercy. When Jesus saw them, he said, Go and show yourselves to the priests. As they left, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, returned and praised God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus replied, Weren't ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one returned to praise God except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, Get up and go. Your faith has healed you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Imagine your life is going well. Your job and career have progressed nicely. Your, uh, your marriage is a good one. Your children are healthy. You have worked hard to build a respectable life. But then one morning, uh, on your arm, you notice a skin blemish, unlike anything you've noticed before. Naturally, you assume that it will disappear in a few days, but it does not. In fact, it it gets larger and uh, the skin around that spot begins to lose its sensation. And although you know it is one of the signs of leprosy, you deny it, cover it until it becomes undeniable. And finally, one day you can hide it no more. As you know, the punishment is severe for those who try to conceal leprosy. And for that reason and for your fear that it may spread to your family, you announce to them that you are a leper. Forced to leave the home, you must now leave your family, abandon your job, And you now live among lepers, this motley band of suffering that until now you had tried to ignore or even not think that they even existed. But lepers survive by begging and scrounging for scraps of food that are left outside the city. And now you are one of them. The priest in the temple has declared you unclean and you are expected to carry a leper bell with you to warn the non-lepers who may approach. When they approach, you ring the bell and you shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. I mean, what did you do to deserve this? I mean, nothing. You're certain of that. But everyone else says, as you once did, that, that, that this leprosy is something that God has done for you for a reason. And so here you are, a leper. Your life continues. A person rarely dies from leprosy. But you've lost everything. You've lost your family, your home, your job, your dignity. 
And you're now forced to associate with some rather despicable people, even Samaritans. But then one day, you and nine of the other lepers encounter a Galilean teacher that that many say is able to heal leprosy. And all he says to you is to go show yourselves to the priests. Now the priests are the only ones who can legally verify that leprosy is cured. And halfway to the priest, the lesions on your skin disappear. You've been healed. I mean, this great injustice has been removed. And all ten of you are relieved, you cheer, you embrace each other, and one, the, the, the Samaritan, decides to, to go back and find this Galilean healer. But not you. You're not ready for that. You're too angry and distraught. I mean... What about all the wasted months and and years of your life? What about all the lost time with your family? Who's going to restore that? What about your your job and, and your reputation? Who's going to fix that? Who's going to make it the way it's supposed to be? No, all that has happened is that a great injustice has been has been corrected. I mean, let the Samaritan go back and give thanks. He probably deserved his leprosy. He's lucky that he was even allowed to to associate with the rest of you. Now you, your life has been restored. What is rightfully yours has been given back. And you are not ready to return to Jesus. You know, according to Luke's gospel, all ten were set free from leprosy. But let me suggest that only one of them was completely healed. You know, if we were among those ten, would you be one of the nine? Or would you be the one who took the time to return and give thanks? You know, in my own life, it's not that I'm not thankful. It's just there is so much in my life. There is so much in my life that is not right. I mean, early one morning, about a week ago, I, I took our dog, Winston, for a walk through our neighborhood. It was, it, it was cold that morning. It had just snowed. The wind was blowing, and I realized I, I needed another layer of clothing. And I began thinking about how that day was not the day I wanted it to be. And then I began thinking about all the things that are not right about this year, this year 2020. And I I thought about all the things that I'm missing and how I'm missing being among other people. And then one thought led to another and to another and to another. And by the time Winston and I got back to the house, it felt like the whole world was pushing in on me. But you know, instead of thinking about everything that was wrong, I could have stopped to give thanks. You know, the point of this story that we find in Luke's gospel, the point of the story is found in verse 19. Jesus says to to the one who returned to give thanks, Jesus said to, to the one, to the Samaritan, the outcast among outcasts, get up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now the man has already been healed of leprosy, so what is Jesus talking about? You know, the Greek word that is translated as as healed can also be translated as, as saved or delivered or made whole. See, his leprosy is gone. 
but he has yet to be healed. And Jesus is saying, you came and you gave thanks, and it is your gratitude that has healed you. It's your gratitude that has made you whole. And we all want wholeness, don't we? I mean, something that will save us from the pain and the brokenness of our lives. And Jesus says that's gratitude. You were made for gratitude. See, my goal at the end of this series is that we will be filled with more gratitude. We will be more grateful than we are. So I'd like you to join me in a 28-day challenge. Each day to write down at least one thing that we are thankful for. Make it a letter that you're writing to God. Dear Lord, I am thankful for. Now we've put together a gratitude journal that you can find on our website. You can print it out or you can download it to your computer or your tablet. I mean, let's see what can happen over the course of these next 28 days. A few years ago when my wife Amanda was going through cancer treatment, we attended a seminar at the Mayo Clinic in which we listened to Dr. Amit Sut. Uh, describe his research on gratitude. Who knew the Mayo Clinic was doing research on gratitude? And, and he described a, a practice that I began implementing in my life. Now, I've, I think I've told you about this before, but he suggests that most of us, when we wake up in the morning, we begin thinking about all the things that, that, that we need to be doing that day. And he says, instead of that, resist that and, and start your day with gratitude. Before you even get out of bed in the morning, Think about five people in your life for whom you're grateful. Picture their faces and send each one of them a silent thank you. Or you could take uh, photos and, and put them on the wall next to your bed so when you get out of bed, the first thing you see is that wall of photos. You pause at that wall and you send a silent thank you to each person that's pictured there. Or you write the word grateful. Write the word grateful on a post-it note and you put it on your bathroom mirror. The point is to begin your day with gratitude. And it's what Jesus was saying 2,000 years ago. Do you want to be whole? I mean, what if we did that each day? See, gratitude matters. It influences our lives. Uh, last week I, I was, uh, John, I'm going to jump back, okay? So l- l- last week I was listening to a TED Talk by uh, Brother David Stengel Rost. And he, he says in his, uh, in his TED Talk, it's not happiness that makes us grateful. It is gratefulness that makes us happy. Hear hear that again. It is not happiness that makes us grateful. It is gratefulness that makes us happy. See, there is something about gratitude that that changes our hearts. I I read this study uh, that was conducted by the University of California, San Diego, in which they took 186 stage B uh, heart patients. And they divided them into two groups, and one group, they, they, uh, they, they asked them to keep a gratitude journal in which they would write down three things every day for which they were grateful. And the other group was a control group, and they were not asked to do anything special. And at the end of the eight weeks, what they discovered is that those who, who kept the gratitude uh, journal, that, that there, were, they were, there was less stress, I mean, they, there, there was less depression, Uh, They slept better, and the markers in their blood had improved. And so Dr. Paul Mills, the author of the study, said, 
A more grateful heart is a more healthy heart. And gratitude journaling is an easy way to support cardiac health. Jesus says it's the way that you're made whole. And I wonder if we could do that each day. See, gratitude matters. It it affects us. And it affects the people around us. I mean, many of us are spending a whole lot more time at home than we ever expected. And many of us are spending a family time, more family time this year than we ever expected. And though that's good, for some of us it's too much of a good thing. And we get under each other's skin. But how are we practicing gratitude? How much is gratitude a part of our lives? I mean, if you were able to rate yourself on a scale between one and five, where five is being grateful all the time and one is you can't remember the last time you said thanks. I mean, where, where, where would you rate yourself? I mean, this is a self-assessment. You don't need to tell anybody else. But, 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 but where would you fall between one and five? And wherever you are, my hope is that by the end of these 28 days, that you'll be able to increase by at least one number. In 1997, Fred Rogers was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Academy of Motion Pictures. It was presented at the Academy Awards that year. And he gave an acceptance speech that is unlike any acceptance speech I've ever heard. Take a look. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. (laughs) So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here, some are far away, some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are? Those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. Ten seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. (laughs) Whomever you've been thinking about, How pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. You know, they're the kind of people television does well to offer our world. Special thanks to my family and friends and to my co-workers in public broadcasting, family communications, and this academy for encouraging me, allowing me, all these years to be your neighbor. May God be with you. Thank you very much. I don't think there was a dry eye in that room. You know, life is a gift. This day is a gift. We didn't do anything to create it or to deserve it. And it wasn't a guarantee. I mean, we live and breathe, and it's all gift. And how we respond to that gift is our gift back to God. Let's pray. You know, let's take 10 seconds. 10 seconds to think of the people who helped you be who you are the people who cared for you and helped you. Ten seconds of silence.
Dear God, help me to be more grateful and to express gratitude to others. Thank you for all the blessings of life. Help us to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in every situation. Amen.